welcome everybody here uh, today for this uh, yeah mega event. It looks like um, the Arts and Society Forum is um, part of the Academy of Ideas, and we've been operating for quite a few years, but. Zoom has surprisingly enough, at least to me, given us a, an opportunity to meet a, a much wider audience, uh, which has been a real fantastic bonus of lockdown. However, hopefully we will be out of lockdown fairly soon. You can see I'm wearing my prison gear just to symbolize our continued containment, but hopefully we will be out fairly soon. I am planning to do a, at least two or three more sessions before um, we're fully exited, uh, speaking in an optimistic note. Uh, and this is the second one of this year. Uh, and this, the topic of this, as you well know, is on Le Corbusier. And I'll be introducing uh, Penny Lewis, our, our speaker, in a few minutes. Before I do that, I wanted to give a quick plug for the Academy of Ideas, um, probably, uh, many of you are aware of the Academy of Ideas, and it's an organization that runs uh, an amazing range of events, including the annual Battle of Ideas Festival, which we hope will return later this year. And it's, it's really an organization that punches above its weight, but operates on a shoestring. So I wanted to just take this opportunity to urge you to support it, either with a one-off donation or even better, uh, join up as an associate because that would get you additional benefits including uh, redu uh, reduced tickets to the Battle of Ideas Festival and other events that the Academy is organising. The whole of lockdown um, the Academy has been organising free events um, and you know has, has, it, has kept open despite everything so please do give it um, any support that you can and, uh, and keep in touch with it on its website. And Mo Lovett, who's co my co-host here today, will um, put all the details up um, on the chat. Um, and while I'm just on the matter of chat, um, do feel free to use the chat as, uh, uh, as you like, but uh, you should be aware that I at least um, find it impossible to follow. So I would really encourage you to um, if you want to say make a point and you want um, it to be aired fully, I would really um, uh, invite you to speak up when you get the chance after Penny has, has spoken. I, when I asked Penny to do this talk and I asked her to select her um, favorite architect, her, uh, she nominated Le Corbusier. And I have to say I was delighted because I sort of grew up with him. My father's best friend next door to us designed his house along the interior of his house, along Le Corbusier principles. And I think I discovered the chapel, the chapel at Ronchamp when I was in my mid teens and just loved it and, and got to sit, see it for the first time a couple of years ago in the, in the, um, in the concrete as it were. And, um, and it does make me wonder, you know, when people blame Le Corbusier for um, some of the awful, housing estates that have been built since the 60s, you know, was he really responsible for those monstrosities when he could create such beautiful um, designs for, for homes and, chap and churches and so forth? Anyway, Penny Lewis is um, a real expert on Corbusier, Le Corbusier, and so she will give her perspective on his influences, uh, his influence and his achievements. She's a lecturer uh, at the, uh, in architecture and urban design at the University of Dundee. And she also leads the joint architectural program at the university with the University of Wuhan in China. So she'll talk to us for about 25 or 30 minutes, give or take. And after that, um, we'll be opening the floor um, or the room to questions and comments. Feel free to express disagreements. Um, and I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with Zoom by now, but I will come back after Penny has speak, spoken with specific instructions on that. Um, so Penny, over to you. Thank you, Wendy. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. Um, yeah, when Wendy asked me to pick an architect, I felt slightly guilty about 
picking Le Corbusier in the, in the sense that when I was a student, it would have been very considered very lazy to pick Le Corbusier as your, as your favorite architect. Um, this morning, I had a, a, an article in my inbox from a leading professor, uh, the Dean, in fact, uh, Mark Wigley uh, of Columbia University School of Architecture, writing about how um, Corbusier's enthusiasm for whiteness was somehow connected to a racialized and exclusionary mode of thought and culture. So it seems important to talk about Le Corbusier at a time in which uh, the modern masters um, really need defending. But I'm also really interested in this subject because I've been thinking and writing about the process of city making and how the process of professionals making cities relates to the very critical question we now face uh, relating to democracy. So Le Corbusier seemed really worth looking at again in some detail uh, as, as a product of the fact that I was uh, thinking about these issues. So I'm gonna put my screen on now and uh, introduce you to the man. I'm, I'm kind of aware that some people will know a lot about Le Corbusier and other people may be introduced being introduced to him. Uh, and as a consequence of that, I've put quite a lot on the slides. I'm not going to talk to all of it, um, but hopefully you can read along with me as I proceed. Okay, so the title um, comes very much from that um, idea that I, I, I just mentioned, um, my interest in the question of city making and democracy. And the thing that's very interesting, as soon as you start to try and reflect upon uh, Le Corbusier's career um, is that um, there's there's definitely sort of many different readings of Le Corbusier and as the material emerges there's quite a strong sense of there being a good Corb and a bad Corb. Um, certainly in the literature from when I was a student that was very much the case and the way that this presents itself is that um, Le Corbusier um, particularly in the um, early part of his career in the 1920s, um, was both associated with the process of rethinking the home and a very famous expression is associated with that where he said the home should be a machine for living in. And then secondly, he's very preoccupied with the nature of the city and the modernization of the city. Um, and he adopted uh, quite a radical approach to the question of, of urban development and made many plans for Paris, which um, horrified <clears throat> certain elements of French society. And as a consequence of that, there's a tendency to read Corb, uh, as I said, as, as good and bad. And his, his urban ambitions are often seen as being problematic, overambitious, overrational, brutal, patronizing. Etc. And his um, work on the house um, is usually seen in a in a more um, in a more positive light. Although the idea of the machine for living in is 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 broadly um, criticised, uh, his attitude towards the organisation of the plan, um, the arrangement of space, uh, the relationship between the mass of a building and, and the surface of the building, all of those. Uh, aesthetic questions, which he engages in in a really rigorous fashion, uh, are understood uh, as being uh, important in terms of making a significant contribution uh, to the development of early 20th century art. So we have this individual um, who's read uh, as, as almost as a split personality, and there are aspects of Le Corbusier uh, which encourages this this kind of kind of reading. But what I want to try and sort of um, present in this brief introduction uh, is a sense that we're talking about uh, an individual here um, who it's not really possible to separate out his enthusiasm for thinking about the future of the city um, from his ability to organize uh, space or, or provide artistic um, uh, and creative activity, that this, this is one man uh, and the ambitions really um, operate side by side. I think what is useful to think about 
is to understand the different context in which he's operating. So Corb's uh, activity spans the 20th century. He's born at the end of the 19th century. He really um, comes to the fore. He's designed a number of buildings in his hometown in Switzerland uh, in the early part of the 19th century uh, as quite a young man. But he really comes to the fore in the early 20s when he um, sets up um, a journal um, uh, with Osenfant uh, and, and starts to write and paint and produce uh, buildings. And so this sort of period um, in the early 20s in, in Paris is very significant uh, in terms of the development of his work. And it's often described as uh, a polemical period or a pioneering period, because during this period, he's really trying to break new ground and argues that there needs to be a complete transformation in the way in which the architect uh, approaches questions. And then there's a, another period of his life, which is reflected in the second picture here by René Bourré, which is taken in 1939, but indicates a, a, an older Corb. And this is the Corb of the post-war period. And in this period, um, he gets not so much to polemicize, but he gets the opportunity to build. And you can see from the artwork here, one in 22, the other in 39, um, that already there's a kind of shift in terms of um, his painting. And there's also a shift in terms of his architecture. So when he suggested that I just picked two buildings to talk to you about Corb through, uh, and so I've picked one from this early period, which is associated with uh, the avant-garde of Europe, um, the Maison La Roche <clears throat> in Paris, and one uh, from the later period, the, the period after uh, 1945 and the Second World War, uh, which is the Unité Habitation in Marseille. And I'm going to concentrate mainly uh, on the first on the first house because I think uh, there's so many ideas in there um, that it's worth spending a little bit of time before moving to the second. But I think the important thing to recognise is that um, Corb's operating in two very different context, one in which he's working against the grain of uh, bourgeois culture, as far as he's concerned, in order to try and uh, propose something um, transformative in the way we think about housing. And in the second period, he's being commissioned and given the opportunity uh, to produce these things, uh, but in a slightly different culture, uh, a, a culture in which uh, the sense of possibility and social transformation is more limited, uh, but the demands on architects and planners is greater. One of the things that um, Corb does get criticized for and did get criticized uh, among his contemporaries for is this idea of the house for, as, as a machine for living in. And I'd, and I'd like to discuss this a bit, but I'd just like to uh, make the point first of all, before we go any further, that um, it's very easy to sort of lump local Bouzier in with the futurists and others um, that were very, very excited about technology and the dynamic possibility of technology. And I think it's important to make a distinction between Le Corbusier uh, and the futurist. Um, to make the point that he um, is not using the machine as a metaphor or a mechanism through which to inspire his aesthetic work. The machine is not uh, an aesthetic device for him. He's using the expression of machine in the same way as he might use the word the a tool, really to talk about uh, the way in which uh, human beings ensure that their social artifacts, the things that they produce, that they surround themselves with, are in keeping um, with the developments in society. And he felt that while certain areas of society were really uh, moving forward as a result of industrialization, architecture had somehow been stuck in the past and been unable to really uh, find ways to express uh, the new values and the new dynamism of society. So he really, if you read any of his books, he really, really hates um, the sort of um, decorative and, and overworked aspects of 19th century bourgeois culture. He's very sort of catty about um, 
the sort of bric a brac -brac of the homes of the, of the bourgeoisie. Um, but he's not mechanistic about what he thinks the alternative should be. He's actually very sophisticated in terms of the aesthetic that he imagines could be developed uh, if architecture uh, rose to the challenge. And nor is he a functionalist in the, in the narrow sense of the word. Quite often he's associated uh, with uh, the more um, functionalist aspects of, of the Bauhaus. And people argue, oh, Corbusier said a house is just a machine for living in. Um, and he meant that all that matters is the function and the operation of, of the machine. Um, and I think that's a, a misreading uh, of Le Corbusier's work. You only really have to pick up towards a new architecture or any of his other texts to realize that he's much more interested uh, in questions of order and harmony of mass and form and surface. Uh, and it would be really wrong to suggest uh, that he's really um, only interested in function. Okay, so for those of you that haven't read it, I've just made a list of some of the key points that are in uh, there's an architecture towards a new architecture as it's translated in English. The reason that I chose um, La Maison Roche is partly because it's published almost exactly the same time as this publication towards a new architecture. So this is a summary of a whole series of articles that Corb's written uh, in this journal that he uh, publishes with his, his friend Ozenfant. And, um, in this incredibly polemical little text, uh, he makes the argument for uh, a new architectural language. And there are various ideas in, in this, which I've listed some of them to the right, but obviously it would need a lot more attention really to, uh, to make for a proper discussion. But you can see in point eight, the housing problem is the problem of the epoch. And this is a, a, a theme all the way through uh, the 1920s. The thing is that in the 1920s, the people that provide Corbusier with an opportunity to address this question of the epoch um, is um, the Swiss and, and the French bourgeoisie. So it's a very different kind of context in which he's working in the 1920s uh, from the period after the Second World War, where he gets an opportunity to address the question uh, at a broader social level. In the text, uh, one of the things that comes across uh, most clearly is Le Corbusier's real enthusiasm for the simplicity of industrial buildings because of the way in which they allow human beings to read uh, their form in a very direct way because they're not covered up with uh, classical motifs or um, organized in, in a way in which uh, their form is hidden. You get the development of an architectural language, which is entirely driven by function and the engineer, um, but which has a certain capacity uh, to touch us. And it's from this uh, recognition of um, the qualities of uh, engineer built uh, buildings as a result of industrialization that he says uh, we've got the opportunity to revisit in architecture, um, the questions of form, surface, uh, and plan. That the, 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 the engineers are lead, leading the way in this, and it's really for the architect uh, to appreciate what it is they're achieving. Um, and um, if you look at uh, towards a new architecture in more detail, you'll find there's a whole number of different ways uh, in which he he describes this, but. The main preoccupation he has is that the role of the architect is to arrange elements as given by industrial society, the new industrialized elements of, uh, of building production. And the role of the architect is to organize them, to arrange them, to create order, and to think about the mass, the surface, uh, and particularly to think about the plan as the mechanism uh, through which um, space and form and, and surface is organized. So uh, this is one of uh, the early buildings that Corb produces in, in Paris with his uh, colleague, Osenfant, 
and it's worth spending a little bit of time looking at the work that they're producing at the same time as uh, the Villa Roche, the Maison La Roche is built. This is um, Still Life by Corbusier with a pile of plates and a similar um, Still Life by Osmond um with a glass of red wine, which you can see there. Um, they concentrated a lot on still life. They were clearly interested in um, industrial artifacts, everyday artifacts. Um, and um, to a certain extent, I suppose, in the same way as the artist organizes products in the creation of a still life before painting it, Corbusier saw um, the role of the architect as uh, organizing and orchestrating the relationship of different elements in bringing together a building. I think in the Ozophant painting, uh, you can see something else really interesting happening, which is implicit in uh, the work that they're pursuing at this time, which is broadly categorized as, as purist. Um, you can see the vase and the glass share uh, a, a, an external line. And I think this is one of the ideas that you will see in the Maison Roche is this idea that the relationship between inside and outside is transformed um, through modern art and through uh, modern architecture. That what appears to be inside in certain situ situations uh, may be outside. And um, if you um, think about uh, the way in which that um, image by Osenfant is, is constructed, it's very much an exploration of this idea of forms intervening and intersecting and overlaying each other and the possibilities uh, that are generated through that. And that idea is very much um, part of a package of ideas that informs um, Corb's thinking about internal spaces. There are other aspects to uh, Corb's thinking in this early period. Uh, it's been written about widely. Um, particularly in the post-war period, it's written about by Colin Rowe, um, but it's written about by Corb himself, and I'll refer to that a little bit later, in terms of his real interest in proportion, classical proportion, the golden section, uh, and various other mathematical frameworks for thinking about uh, what beauty is. And in the, um, in the document, um, towards a new architecture where he's setting out how he thinks architecture should develop. He also covers a whole number of other issues in terms of architectural ambitions. He looks at the Acropolis and talks about the idea of uh, the space between objects, between man-made objects. And he thinks uh, the ancient Greeks had really developed a capacity to look at the way in which buildings related to each other and the space that was formed between buildings. And Siegfried Gideon, who's the historian of the modern movement uh, and was writing about Corb's work, um, saw a, an alignment between this idea and the ideas explored by contemporary artists like Giacometti, uh, who was thinking about uh, the idea of the human object in space. And he also looks at uh, the process by which human beings move through uh, this newly um, conceptualized idea of space. So there's a whole number of different um, ideas of space, human movement, horizons, uh, spaces between buildings being as significant as, as the building uh, form itself. These are all included in um, towards a new architecture, but he's also getting the opportunity to build. So let's get to the first building. Um, and the first building is, as I said, uh, in Paris. Um, it's got, uh, uh, it's a very modest building. And in fact, um, what happened was they had a site which was at the back of this, some existing houses. I think it's in the 16 arrondissement um, and at the time that, that that area of Paris was almost a village, so uh, it was a little bit of a backwater. Um, but during the process of designing this building, 
<clears throat> Corb found that um, the site had got smaller uh, and so uh, the building had to be reduced. His clients were a banker, uh, Roche, uh, Roche, and his own brother. So it's two houses built on a very small, uh, relatively small plot at, at uh, the back of an existing street. And this is the lane that runs down between the two houses. If you look on the right hand side, you can see two sets of double doors and the column uh, between the horizontal windows there marks uh, the two different uh, bits of accommodation. So uh, on our right hand side is the house for his brother and at the bottom of the building uh, is uh, the building that we're going to look at, Maison, Maison La Roche. Okay, so there you can see the Maison La Roche and you can see a little bit of the roof terrace of the building. And then you see round the back of the building um, where the courtyard is uh, and an image uh, that's been generated um, of a, a grain silo making a, a comparison between the forms that Corb's developing and an image from underneath um, the art gallery which is on Pilates. Okay so this is your introduction to La Roche. Here's an axonometric which might make it easier for you to understand the building, especially if you're Spanish, <laughs> because the annotations in Spanish, you can see there's a gallery, a library, a garden, uh, a special purist space, which is actually a bedroom uh, and a dining room and, the, and, and an entrance hall. So this, this relatively uh, modest uh, apartment house uh, is built really around this uh, central core space. And I'm going to take you on a journey uh, around the building. La Roche had um, quite a, a good uh, collection of modern art, including Osmfant and Le Corbusier's art, but uh, Braque and Picasso and, and others as well. So this house was designed really um, to be a gallery as well as a home and a lot of the energy and, and resources went into um, generating the gallery. So here we're on the second floor and you can see at the bottom of the screen uh, on the left hand side is the gallery space which has um, a curved wall and, and a ramp running up the side of it uh, and um, then uh, Above that, there's a library, and to the right of that is the main uh, entrance space of the building. Just to help you orientate yourself, if you if you can. Um, so we were looking before up here, and we saw the gallery space here with the pilotes, the columns underneath. So to enter the building, you come, you turn into uh, this hall space, which is a three-story void. You then, if you want to go up onto the first floor, you take the stairs here um, and you come up uh, into um, uh, a balcony, uh, which overlooks back into the hall space takes you through to the dining room um, and potentially takes you through to the ground floor of the gallery space. Once you've looked at the gallery, if you want to go further up the building, you come up the ramp and you arrive at the top uh, floor where there's this little breakout space and the library. Um, or alternatively, if uh, you're a member of the family, you use this small stairs here to come up uh, into the sort of private space and out uh, to the terrace. So that's basically how the building's organized. And no, it won't let me move. Yes, I need to get rid of my annotation. And you've had about 25, a bit over 25 minutes. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay, I'm going to move very quickly. <laughs> so there's the entrance. Uh, and 
Um, there's the space, the entrance space, as you would enter it. Um, if you're if, if you are a visitor coming through the front door there on the bottom and then either coming up in one direction or the other uh, to the balcony is another of Ozenfant's buildings. Um, again, showing this relationship between inside and outside. What's inside the bottle or inside the next bottle or the overlapping qualities uh, of the different uh, objects is not entirely clear. And uh, in this central space, which is really the key um, central um, selling point of the building, uh, you can see that you have the same process um, going on. So it's a three-story void uh, in which um, balconies and stairs uh, and to a certain extent ramps and uh, small spaces off um, the main space um, give the, the space an incredibly dynamic feel. So this is coming into the building. This is moving up, up towards uh, the walkway at the first level, looking along to the dining room, looking along to the dining room on one direction, and then you can see the bottom of the ramp on the other direction. So to the right is the gallery space, then you're in the gallery space. This is the gallery space as it would have been when it was first occupied. And then you're moving up the ramp to this little interim space that leads to the library and back in the other direction the bed and the roof terrace okay so i've taken up too much time um but within this building and a number of buildings after that um Corbusier really re rewrites the rule book for how we think about uh, the organization of the house. And he identifies various different ways in which we can completely transform our thinking about architectural form and space. And these are often summarized as being uh, his five points that he, he suggests we have a different attitude towards the plan instead of rooms, we have a free plan organized around structural elements, but not dictated by structural elements. That we have the possibility to have activity on the roof. That we should raise buildings off the ground and have freedom of movement at the ground level. That windows now no longer need to be holes punched in load bearing walls, but can be uh, open, uh, free expression of whatever is going on inside and the tendency therefore is to have horizontal windows. And the best probably expression of this thesis is the Villa Savoir in Poissy, which he finished uh, three years later. Okay, so I'm gonna have to very quickly move to the second building. I've not got time to talk about um, his attitude towards urban design, um, but if you were to summarize uh, his approach to the question of the city, um, there's a very strong strand of rationalism in, in what he's interested in. So he takes some of the logic of what he's been talking about in relation to the individual house, and he applies that to uh, the organization of the city, and he makes some very bold suggestions about how the city might be reorganized. Okay, so just to finish now, I'm going to look at the second building and to look at um, what happens post-war. So he's promoting all of these ideas pre-war. He has little opportunity to build except for, for the rich and the bohemian. And then post-war, um, he is given the opportunity um, to build by the French state, by the government directly. And one of those opportunities uh, is particularly the Unité Habitation. And he uses that <laughs> Uh, building as an opportunity to explore an idea he's been thinking about uh, throughout the 40s um, during the war period, which is even if we can't revolutionize the way in which we um, mass produce architecture, although that's still an ambition, perhaps we can transform 
uh, the way in which we organize the production of building components and the thinking about space so that we get something that's reasonable and usable and efficient. He develops this idea of the modular and this idea is tested out. Uh, he publishes a book and then another book about the modular. He discusses it with Einstein and Einstein says, yes, this looks like a good idea. Um, it's very much driven by uh, mathematics and ideas of the golden section. Um, and then he gets the opportunity um, to build in relation to it. So you can look at Unite Habitation in Marseille in lots of different ways. Some people say it's the first co-op building, um, first cooperative housing. Other people say it's the model for the worst kind of social housing uh, that very quickly uh, was transformed into slums. Corb did get an opportunity to do a few more versions of Unite, but not very many. It wasn't really taken up. Um, he, um, as I said, uh, used the uh, building to test the idea that you could design according to uh, proportions and building components according to proportions. He was very interested in the idea that this new uh, way of stacking housing units uh, could provide everybody with much greater degree of sunlight and fresh air, and also that it would allow for the creation of shared facilities. So within um, Unite itself, um, units were organized so that people got east and west light. So every unit was on a split level. Um, not every unit, every family unit was on a split level. Uh, and within that split level, um, you had uh, windows opening to both sides of um, this massive block. Um, and you had a double height uh, living space uh, that ran through, uh, through um, two, two levels. He developed 23 house types and, and some of them were hotel rooms and others were for families up to the size of 10. He developed the idea of taking the building off the ground in a much more visceral uh, way. The thing you'll notice about the work in this period is rather than being smooth and the surface of the building being uh, very refined, um, partly because of material availability in the post-war period, but also because Corb is also changing his sensitivities, uh, the materials change to a much rawer expression of concrete um, and the use of wood and glass and color in a very different way. He's still thinking about the surface of buildings, uh, but he's uh, expressing the surface of the buildings in a different way. There were 26 fat shared facilities in Unite Habitation. Um, I've got my fingers on the 337 dwellings and um, a, a real range of shared facilities, including a supermarket. And apparently this is one of the first time people in Marseille had seen a supermarket. One of the complaints about the units is they're very small. I mean, I think he would say they're compact and the furniture is all built in. He, he was not a fan of bourgeois furniture, he said he didn't need it, that he provided everything that was needed. I suppose it's one of the reasons why he gets um, described as arrogant. Probably the most expressive element of the building is the roof where there's a gym and a paddling pool and um, a space for theatre uh, for local people. And um, that's the end of the tour of Unite Habitation. Um, around this same period, he's working in India. He's producing uh, really compelling and expressive work at Ronchamps and at La Tourette in France for the church, who's a brand new client for him. He never thought he was going to be designing for the church. And he's holding on to this idea um, that there could be a sort of universal organization of architectural expression which wasn't about telling architects how to design, um, but was ensuring that industrial production provided 
the right kind of components for architects to allow them to really exercise uh, their creative will in arranging and bringing together things uh, in a meaningful way. Okay, I've gone over my time, sorry about that. All right. Um, yeah, that was really fascinating, Penny. I'm, uh, there's obviously a huge amount to say. I'm glad I told you to focus just on two buildings. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> right, um, so this is um, a chance to uh, ask questions, express sort of your own ideas about Le Corbusier and, um, you know, sort of what you're, you're interested in knowing about, in knowing more about. It really is, um, I think, a very broad audience here. So don't worry if you've got really basic questions. And um, also, if you've got a lot of knowledge and some disagreement with Penny, that's also fine. What I'll do is I'll take um, a number of uh, questions and points. And um, if you can put up your hands, and then I will ask Penny to come back and respond after we've gone through a few. Um, okay, Alka, do you want to uh, unmute yourself? Yeah, there okay, you can you hear me? Yeah, yes, just about, speak up a bit. <clears throat> okay, I'll try yeah. to. Got my glass of red wine here. Thanks, yeah. Penny, that was lovely. Took me down memory lane when I studied Le Cabousier as an undergraduate. Um, I just wanted to really share some observations, really, which have come to mind really since I went to India a few years ago and, and stayed in Chandigarh and um, saw uh, his designs. I've also I haven't seen I've seen the um, uh, the, the Maison de, de Roche, but uh, not any of his other ones in France. Um, I love the Maison Roche when I first went to see it many years ago because of its beautiful materials and space and, and I mean it is just gorgeous <clears throat> but it did strike me how luxurious it was I seem to remember it being kind of marble and jade and really gorgeous materials like that um, in India though it's really interesting actually what, what, what's happened in, in Chandigarh because he was um, he was invited by jo Jawaharlal Nehru um, in, in the early 50s to come and um, uh, build this town of Chandigarh, which was going to be the new capital of the Punjab because Lahore had been taken up with Pakistan after partition. So it's very much tied with uh, the, the political internal politics of India and of the Congress party and trying to develop <clears throat> um, a, a culture and take society in a, in a modern way, in a way that was, you know, sort of going against the backward certain backward traditions in India, but also anti-colonialist. It was also anti, it was also against the kind of British style of architecture that India had known. So there he goes, he was persuaded and he goes and he builds this city according to this grid-like plan. But it, it really doesn't work. It really, there's something really missing. And it's quite interesting because in Chandigarh, there's another place that you you never hear of. Everyone hears of the Cabuzier, although actually, in actual fact, when you go there, it's not like there's a big museum or any great, um, you know, celebration of Le Cabuzier. But all the waste that was produced during the making of Le Cabuzier's plan was taken, was collected by an Indian civil servant who was involved in, in the Le Cabuzier building. But he collected all the waste materials and he built this rock garden, which is just stunning. I mean, it's like Dali's um, Park of Guell, uh, you know, but even bigger and more massive. It's incredibly, with completely different aesthetic to it. Um, and that's a park, you know, it's not a housing unit, but it just really made me think about, um, what was admirable about Le Cabuzier, but also the limits of that sort of trying to impose a kind of a rule bound system on things where there was leaving very little space for um, what was already there to grow, you know, to, to have some conversation with what existed with elements of the past. And instead it was like a sort of ground zero approach. And I really have to say, I really don't think it works in Chandigarh at all. That's Thanks for really useful points. Um, okay, Niall? Yeah, great talk. And probably it's a bit of a follow on, I guess, from uh, what Alka just said, um, but a slightly different tact. Um, you mentioned at the beginning, uh, Penny, about was it democracy and the city, which kind of intrigued me. And it made me think about how 
um, how people use buildings, which is why it kind of touches on what Alka said. Because um, obviously sometimes people think these buildings don't don't work. They were too drastic and too inhuman, and uh, you know all of those kind of kind of things that people have uh, tarred them with over the last fifty years or so. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier on the on the chat about pale kind of imitations of um i can never say it, the, the the marseille building which when i went there everything kind of fell into place all these buildings all these tower blocks i'd seen in in england uh, so I, I suddenly realized where they come from and it really is a truly beautiful building but i guess what struck me over the years is that uh, what makes buildings is the people and um you know i've seen some wrecks of buildings i've been around places like bulgaria and the czech republic and seen the worst tower blocks and actually sometimes they just were because there's a community there and you know may, I don't, i'm not sure why chandragar doesn't work but it seems to me that people maybe that's a bit of a cliche but people seem to make the buildings work you know no matter if if they're going to work they're going to work if people need them they will make them work and maybe the reason a lot of the british buildings don't don't work is because people have no control they're controlled by local authorities when people have the chance to kind of have some real control over them um then 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 they will work and um um maybe architects are a little bit too prescriptive and that they think that that that, that um you know they can modify people's behavior with architecture i guess that would be my other my other worry really but but uh you know um i'm not sure where i'm going okay i'll stop great <clears throat> thanks also some good points there uh russell can you unmute yourself hi uh, yeah um I mean, I think there's no doubt Corbusier was was a genius in many senses as a as a creative architect, but um, the uh, the other important side of 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 his work is is its international influence. After all, this was the international style and um, had huge influence around the world. A lot of it negative, I suppose for which Corbusier himself can't really entirely be blamed. Although, thank God, his uh, plan for Algiers, where he uh, intended to put a sort of flying uh, megastructure through the Casbah and, and destroy the Casbah entirely, was, was never able to be implemented. But uh, I mean, in, throughout Africa, you will find, I think as Niall pointed out, sort of sub core examples of, of official architecture and state architecture and mass housing, much of which has never worked. Um, I mean, just, just from the South African example, I mean, we had a professor at, at Wits University Architectural School, which I went to, um, called Rex Martinson, who was an early South African disciple of Corbusier after he took a trip to, to Europe in his youth. And he produced uh, a lot of um, Corbusier white uh, concrete houses in Johannesburg, which very rapidly got covered with pink Spanish plaster and, and turned into a sort of Spanish villas because they just didn't work in, in, in South Africa. So the kind of uncritical ad adaptation of, of Corb's ideas internationally uh, was a problem. Although I, I think it's it's interesting to look at Brazil, where I think his 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 ideas were really rolled out on a gigantic scale, particularly in Brasilia. And I mean, somebody told me that adjoining Brasilia now is a huge shanty town, so I'm not sure what that looks like. But uh, a lot of the later uh, influence of his ideas came in South Africa anyway via Brazil and some quite nice interesting stuff where it had been sort of softened and adapted to to a different kind of environment and a different kind of social organization so I think it's it's quite a mixed picture but th there's no doubt he had huge influence for a very long time on on architects anyway and the people who had to put up with architects experiments uh, in uh, shaping their lives Okay, great, thanks. There's some really interesting points for you to respond to, Penny. Shall I take a couple of more points and then you mm -hmm. come back? Yeah. Yeah. 
So um, <clears throat> next we've got Michael Owens. So um, it, it's the uh, Penny. Penny was talking about the idea of of uh, that we think of Le Corbusier uh, in relation to an aesthetic, you know, and the. So you think of Le Corbusier and you don't think of those beautiful bourgeois houses. You think of Unité d'Habitation, you know, you think of a massive slab, you know, or, or, or the tower block, you know, it's that, that's the kind of uh, the, the, the cliche uh, that we that we think about. And I suppose that, you know, thinking about the, you know, the idea that we would think rationally about development today, um, that we, you know, that if, if it were possible for us to uh, to unlock um, technological possibilities, if we kind of enter the new productive phase, then, um, you know, to what extent um, is there a fix at the level of form? You know, you would imagine that the, you know, that the 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 the, the technological possibilities uh, given by modular developments and uh, new construction methods. Uh, would allow uh, a whole variety of different forms. So um, I suppose that the kind of first, you know, thing to follow from that is the, the idea of to what extent could we imagine uh, a different aesthetic, you know, that would come from the contents of Le Corbe's approach, which wasn't, you know, driven in the first instance by aesthetics, but rather, um, you know, by the... Um, you know, by, by, by the idea of engaging with, with technological possibilities. And then I think the second side of that, um, uh, it's, the, the, you know, uh, so Alka makes the point about, uh, about, about Chandigarh and, and then uh, Russell draws attention to, um, you know, to, 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 to Brasilia and to South Africa. The idea that the fix um, becomes appalling when people move in and the way that people live don't respond to the kind of, you know, to the the kind of, um, you know, what you consider to be a formula, if you will, you know, that the, the, the architect had an idea and the people don't conform to it, you know, and so there's this whole thing about how you, um, and again, to me, it, it's a question of technological possibility. To what extent uh, can you uh, build in a flexibility so that you can respond um, to the lived experience of developments afterwards, and yet follow Le Corbusier's principles. Okay, yeah, all right, so next I've got Stephanie Borkham and then I'll ask Penny to come back. Can you, um, and respond, can you unmute yourself, Pet Steph? Yeah, yeah, there you go. The only, the only Le Corbusier building that I've seen in the flesh is this primary school canteen in a French village in the Loire. And it's so it's so beautifully designed and child friendly with little wooden coat hooks and it's just the most kind of delightful building you can imagine like a little crocodile queues of children going into it and it was still in use until 2014 but that really kind of contradicts the only thing that i've read about le corbusier which is by richard sennett so i'd like penny if you can say something because Senate has really um, tried to dismantle Le Corbusier, saying that his buildings were all about limiting social interaction and that um, they destroyed neighbourhoods and the street life. So I just wanted to know a bit more about um, that, really, and Senate's kind of view. Yeah. OK, thanks very much. Um, so, Penny, there's quite a few dissenting points there. Do you want to...? respond well um senate is interesting and um jane jacobs as well um because they're seen as the first people to really um produce a very strong critical argument against what was the project for jane jacobs in new york um and um the, and, and for senate as well I think what's really interesting about that material that's produced in the 50s, so it's sort of almost as soon as Corbusier is building these uh, blocks, there's a reaction against it. In fact, before he builds them, there's a reaction against it in France, um, where people say these blocks will make, make you mentally ill. And there's a whole range of different professionals come out and say these are a very, this is a very dangerous housing form. 
the thing that I find most interesting about Jane Jacobs' critique is that she makes a, a really interesting point, which is that it's not, I mean, she makes some criticisms of the form of these new kind of uh, housing blocks. But one of the key points she makes is the problem with these blocks is that everything is run by the state. So the state is your landlord, the state runs your shops, uh, you know, they're collecting your rent, they're probably employing you as well. They're running the social services that come to visit you. And as a product of that, it's very difficult to have any kind of privacy. And what they identified when they looked at a lot of these early post-war redevelopment schemes was that uh, actually you got a breakdown in community, not because of the particular form of the building or even because people had been moved because people were used to having to move. The problem more was that because every aspect of life was tied into the state, it led to a sort of disintegration of trust between ordinary people. So you didn't want to admit if you'd lost your job because then they might, people might sort of tell uh, individuals working for the council. You didn't go to um, a different shop uh, on, a, on an adjoining street uh, in order to get a little bit of um, credit um, because you couldn't afford your shopping during the week because that shop was owned by the same people who were your landlords. It was this kind of, this sense that you'd actually broken down um, the openness and freedom that existed uh, within the old social network uh, that allowed people to have a little bit of privacy. And because privacy was eroded in these new schemes, then also trust was. And once trust broke down, then it was very difficult uh, to man maintain any kind of uh, sense of community interaction. And Jacobs is really explicit about that. Uh, so her critique is about these people who think that you can social engineer, that you can social engineer happiness and contentment and, and community. Um, Bennett uh, is less explicit about that and is, is more concerned about um, the process of um, people moving to the suburbs, I think. But I think that's, in, that's important because when you look at the post-war period, the thing that strikes me is that it's the you know, it, it's the process of social engineering, which is a political process in which the architect is given a particularly high status. So the, it's not the architects leading this process, but it's a, a shift in the way in which politics is organized in society, you know, predominantly off the back of the experience of defeat uh, throughout the 30s and um, you know, the, the, the demobilization of uh, any kind of uh, working class organizations. That means by the time you get to 1945, you've just got a professional elite of which architects are part who go around reorganizing society as they think would be appropriate. And, and society does need reorganizing because there really is a housing crisis. So in, in a way, I think it's less about architects being consistently arrogant and proposing things that people won't like and more about the fact that, because that's their job, basically. Architects basically propose things, it's tested. If people don't like it, then they sh should change it. It's more about the fact that that happens in something of a political vacuum in the post-war period. Whereas in the twenties, it happens on the back of very strong demands that are coming out of society uh, for new housing. Uh, and for better conditions for ordinary people. So um, I kind of, I maybe sound like an apologist for Le Corbusier and he, he was an elitist. He was, he was um, a believer that the bourgeoisie should lead the process of reorganizing society, uh, but at least there were ambitions. And the reason that I made such a big play of before the war and after the war is because I think that's really, what's different um, is that he was excessively ambitious before the war uh, and he got an opportunity to experiment with those ideas. Um, and there was ambition in society. And after the war, um, he's moderated to some extent in his ambitions, although 
uh, he does get an opportunity um, to build unity, but he builds unity at a moment whereby the social impetus behind unity, the idea that people might live together in a rational, organized fashion in a meaningful way, that social impetus is already off the agenda. All right. Um, okay, thanks, Penny. Um, okay, we've got a couple more speakers, but there's plenty more time. So if you'd like to speak, do um, put up your hand. And um, there are quite a lot of, I, mean, I suppose one of the big tensions and people can have their um, express their opinion about that is that sense of the thing that I suppose I'm most interested in is that idea of buildings being beautiful and um, functional and whether Le Corbusier made a beautiful and you know that their, their, their form their form of beauty expresses their function but does it beautifully and I wonder um, I suppose one of the questions is whether Le Corbusier um, you know was driving that forward in, on his, you know he was part of a, a, a big change going on because there was also Bauhaus wasn't there um, going on at that time whether he was sort of like really in the forefront of of um, either one of those trends or, or pushing forwards both of them and whether he um, I suppose the sort of his bad reputation is is more to do with um, a kind of rethinking of that period of history not just of Le Corbusier but anyway um, Austin you're next can you unmute yourself I am uh, yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Uh, very nice uh, presentation, Penny. In as much as um, architecture is as much about the space between buildings, I also thought that maybe there was uh, the things that you didn't say uh, or didn't have time to say uh, were as interesting or threatened to be as interesting as what you did say. So I just wanted to give you a chance to maybe to, to, to fill in those gaps. One, one is, um, which is what you've just been talking about in some respects, about the kind of universal solutions versus the, the, the private or individual solutions. Um, which reflect on the politics of the time, the ambitions, the social ambitions, uh, as well as the kind of the, pr the, the, the private elitism. But that idea, so you've, you've got the, the mass housing uh, symbolic uh, after the Second World War and the private dwellings beforehand, but in some ways, the sense of universalism or the striving for a universal modernist ambition was pre-war and slightly kind of died out maybe after the Second World War and certainly today. So I just wanted to if I'm not confusing the question too much, I just wanted to, to take a look at what you said at the very beginning, that idea about um, uh, Corbusier or modernism's whiteness reflecting on the whiteness of the perpetrators. Um, the, 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 the contemporary discourse is one of anti-universalism, of one of diversity versus compliance, the idea about the individual being supreme, uh, and it's all about that kind of identity politics. And I wonder how you think that conversation that Corbusier started uh, does fit in today. How, what is the response to that um, um, dismissal, uh, rejection, uh, outright rejection of universal values? And to flip it back in history, if you could also comment on the fact that actually one thing which is seldom reflected on with Corbusier is the continuity of the historical motifs rather than his, you know, in preference to kind of concentrating on his radical revolutionary break from some of those ideas. So that idea about space and greenery and fresh air, uh, which he talks about in Vezin Architecture, uh, it, that, that, that continues, doesn't it, from whether it's, whether it's William Morris, or whether it's the Garden City movement and, and all the rest of it. So is it, is it possible you could just give us a little bit of those pre and post conversations about his his um, his inspirations and also his legacy? Yep, good. I, I should also say that people um, should feel free to respond to what other people have said, not just Penny. So if you want to um, <clears throat> argue with any particular point, and I think <clears throat> I suppose because of the topicality of it, the the idea of um. Uh, white identity um, or identity be politics being related to um, Le Corbusier is something that didn't strike me until Penny mentioned it, but uh, you know it's something maybe that people would want to pick up on. Um, but I've got Paul Reeves and then um, yeah, anybody else who wants to speak, um, please do. Uh, yeah, Paul, can you unmute yourself? Uh, yeah, you can hear me, I guess. Yes, I good. 
Yeah, um, what I like about these arts and society talks is they your mind spins off somewhere else. But uh, I've got an engine, uh, engineering background and I noticed Penny mentioned engineering and engineers quite early on, especially about uh, the inspiration on Le Corbusier back in the 20s and 30s. I think two quote, there was two quotes I, I picked up on. One was it Le Corbusier believed that engineers or engineering was leading the way. And also the engineers were inspired by, I wasn't sure if it was the economy or economy and maths and so achieved harmony. Uh, and my point is, I guess today, um, the engineers are expected to he achieve harmony with nature. I guess that's the primary thing. It seems to be now and will be into the future. Uh, their prime directive, as it were, is to reduce the human footprint. And it, uh, this often manifests its tell itself in terms of biomimicry, imitating nature in one shape or form. And this can be just simply through the inspiration of shapes, I guess, which is more of an architectural thing, but often it is in terms of um, structure, load bearing structures and materials. The idea is you learn from nature. Uh, and also the aim is to reduce weight, maybe use less materials, maybe use different materials, which in some ways can be good. It's, it's even innovative if you've got new, you're using maths in new ways to do new structures, I guess. But I guess to get back to my original point, we're now in a situation today where you could argue that engineers, instead of leading the way, have kind of lost their way. They're, they're dictated by following nature, I guess. So what I, I suppose my, my point might be, if Le Corbusier was around today or if there was a run around today, would this impact of not leading the way actually how how this is to penny i guess how does she think how or can she explain maybe how this would actually have a impact because clearly it had a big impact on the Corbusier and, and other architects is this what is the impact of this engineers as it were the guys in the background having on the way architects work and are inspired today good question yeah uh, okay, Jenny. I hope this isn't a misunderstanding um, of of the of the architecture, but I was very interested in the idea that for mass housing, you could actually think in terms of modules and the construction of of very self-contained, very I hate to use the word functional, but that the form of something could be aesthetically pleasing but also functional and that it that the relationship between modules and space could actually provide um, a really pleasant sort of environment in which people could live in a sort of mass basis but what um, what I suppose my question is 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 to what extent have architects sort of transferred some of these ideas about modularity to a period where you could mass produce different kinds of modules, uh, you know, to, to suit different types of families um, and, and actually really speed up the process of building more and more houses um, that could become cheaper and cheaper because they're produced in a modular fashion. Sorry if that's a bit simplistic. Good, good. Yeah, I suppose my, related to that is thinking about progress since then, because presumably, you know, despite what Paul says, there has been huge levels of progress in engineering. And in fact, you see, you know, these amazing towers and tower blocks and, you know, going all um, around, you know, walk, looking up the Thames at the moment, um, there is, you know, massive amounts of building tower blocks going on. They they do seem to be somewhat modular and also very inventive on the whole with a form. Um, and I suppose, is there, is Le Corbusier's, has, has design gone way beyond Le Corbusier? Or is he still a kind of a reference point? I mean, you, you said in your introduction that you thought that, um, you know, you were, you were, had been taught, told or were worried it was a lazy choice to choose Le Corbusier because he's such a standard um, icon of architecture. But is that, 
is that there's still the case that he's sort of like is that you know basically he's in a way the founder founder of modern you know 20th century post 20th century architecture and does that influence still continue or has it been over um overreached anyway um so i haven't got any more people asking to speak i'll let penny come back and make some a few comments and i can always just um go into a more informal mode if people prefer and sort of like we once penny's sort of made a few comments we can uh um if there's nobody else to speak i'll just sort of um sit back as chair and uh open it up to a, a more free approach to people um chipping in there's quite a few points in um the chat being raised which uh people might like to pick up on but anyway penny over to you um the thing about Le Corbusier is that it's all contradictory, I think. <laughs> Everything you look at, he's one thing and the other at the same time. One of the things, like I, for this, I reread Woods and New Architecture and some other material. And um, the thing you get a really strong sense of is the tension that existed um, in that period between an absolute compulsion to take society forward, which influenced all classes in society. Um, and there was a very strong sense of agency in relation to that. And at the same time, the kind of fear and anxiety about the fact that um, should uh, ordinary people really take the reins, then everything would be turned on its head. So there's a kind of, there's a very interesting tension in, in his writing. And I think that then people sort of look at that and they make judgments about it based on our experience now. Um, and and it seems so sort of inappropriate. So one, one of the things he says, which he's, he's really rude about bourgeois private life. And he just describes it and he sort of talks about all these, um, businessmen who are in their factories and they feel really comfortable and at home and understand their relationship to the world in their factories because they're being creative and creating things and then they go back to these really dark and dingy bourgeois residences where kind of dripping with uh, decorative details and everything is padded and everything is in sort of dark damask and they're surrounded by bric-a-brac it's everywhere uh, and it's a kind of critique of the way in which the 19th century sort of um, consumer society was developing. But it's also quite interesting because he's sort of saying uh, it, it's not enough for human beings just to be at home. And when we're not working, we, we should have higher aspirations. So he talks about the home and he means this for the working class as well as for the professional classes as well as the book. He says the home should be somewhere where you can really reflect, where you've really got space, where you can view out, where you can find privacy and where you can sort of make things happen. And, and I find that very compelling. I think that's really, particularly at the moment, I think, because we're all stuck at home. So he, So there are elements within what he says, which is not sort of, conventionally can attract quite a lot of criticism, which I think are not social engineering. They're just a very positive universal impulse for human beings to move forwards. And then there are moments when that steps over into him basically dictating to people how they should live their private lives. And there's lots of stories, if you read about Corb, where people complain, <laughs> they, they complained about the building leaking, and he said, well, just don't don't live like that, then live in a slightly different way. And this is art and it's very important. So, so I'm always a little bit ambiguous about the criticisms of him because um, I think you have to look at them quite specifically. So Alka's point at the beginning about Sandigar, I think that's right. I mean, I, I've never been and I'd love to go, but the reports that I've heard is that it doesn't work. I've also heard that Brasilia doesn't work. But my understanding of that was that that was set up in a really bizarre way as a sort of administrative center for the administrative class. And so as a piece of social engineering, it was a very peculiar 
creation anyway. It was a political creation that was strange. It wasn't so much the idea that it was starting from nothing that was the problem. It was the whole basis of the con construction that was the problem. I mean, on Austin's point, um, I think I'm trying to talk about that at the moment. It's quite uh, difficult. Um, universal values, I mean, the, there are a lot of people that would argue that um, you shouldn't teach modular anymore because it's based upon the male body. It's actually based on an American male body as well. <laughs> so everybody else's nose is put out of joint because they're not six foot tall. Um, and that just seems so sad that he was trying to say you should be able to overcome the limitations of bourgeois society to the point whereby we can generate some kind of meaningful measure. It didn't have to be his measure, some kind of meaningful measure that allowed us to push construction forward because construction is currently backward. But not just push construction forward, but think about what human beings need and think of what appropriate sizes are. And the one thing that people will say that if you visit any of Corbusier's buildings, the scale or the size of them seems particularly good. They do feel particularly comfortable for human beings, but it's been really well thought through uh, the relationship between uh, the space and human activity. Um, and and I think that it's I think that it's a real tragedy um, that we can't even really now recognize or celebrate uh, that basic ambition which which Corb expressed because there's this constant reaction gap. Anything that claims to be universal uh, is associated with uh, domination in some form or another. And similarly, um, I mean, I think Corb felt that himself. So even though he got the opportunity to build Unit A uh, in 1946, you can see from his work and his writing, um, things, have, th things have changed. I mean, architects were strongly influenced by the broader political and cultural move against reason and rationality that, you know, that uh, to think about a rational approach to the planning of a city um, would have seemed in, entirely sort of logical, even if there was a reaction to it in 1920. But in 1945, it was very closely associated with the experience of fascism. And as the post-war period progressed, what you notice is that even though people are still making big plans in Chandigarh or Brasilia or anywhere else, those plans quite often have an organic quality to them. Um, so they, they, there's a real reluctance to engage in that kind of speculation that Corb did in the 1920s, which is to say, well, let's just have a grid and let's organize things according to zones. And we can, we can reflect now and sort of say, well, it doesn't work to separate out functions. But the way that society reacts against that kind of decision making um, now is disproportionate to what the problem was. So because Corb said we should separate out housing from business and the administrative center, and he and he produced these master plans with all of these separated functions, for the last 30 years, that's been described as being a fascist exclusionary kind of response to urban planning, which is ludicrous, but that's become an acceptable way to describe that. Now you have to have everything on top of everything. Everything has to be mixed up. And if it's not mixed up, then you're excluding somebody or you're building a boundary somewhere. And, and you know, that, that's a real problem, I think. Certainly a problem in places like China where they're building new cities. Uh, that it's it's very difficult now to make any proposition because that legacy that Corbusier began in the 1920s has been entirely rubbished. And I think that it should be criticized. And I think Alka's right to make the point that some of these um, projects have failed. But I don't think they failed because they were a grid or because they were particularly rational or because they separated functions. Um, and you look at the Congress International Architect Modern that Corb set up to defend the ideas that he'd been promoting in the 1920s. 
and immediately after the war, all the young guys come into that and they're starting to talk about an ecological approach to urbanism, which is more organic. They're not wrong either. They're not, they're not the new greens. They're just recognizing the fact that there's something problematic about the political framework that exists in 1945 that it's inevitable that what happens will be technocratic and top down. And the way they try and compensate for that is to provo provide design solutions that don't look too rational, that don't look too top down. They're still top down, but they just don't have the aesthetic that we associate uh, with reason in, in the pre-war period. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's um, very, very interesting, very useful. Um, so there are no more. Oh, Alka, did you want to come back? Um, I, I'll ask, um, is there anybody else who wants to say, say a few words? Oh, good. OK, suddenly. Um, let, let's have Nico first and then Alka. Um, so, yeah, Nico. Um, I was interested in a comment by Richard Williams, the writer, uh, in the context of lockdown and Corbusier on the changing nature of the modern city. And in fact, um, Richard Sennett did a lecture about this in the Architecture Foundation's 100 Days series early on in lockdown. And Williams noted that um, uh, uh, Corbusier was influenced to an extent, as I guess most architects were in that period, by the issue of hygiene in the city and disease. And that was a key theme of modernism as well as how to enable people to have space and exercise and um, you know break out of uh, dank unsunlit houses which you, you've referred to. I wondered if there was a, a more explicit narrative that Corbusier had around the challenge of hygiene and public health that maybe influenced his work uh, as well. Hmm. Alka, do you want to unmute? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Penny. I just wanted to um, ju just sort of um, make clear to you that I, I, I think I, I wasn't, my, I, what I was pointing to was not the fact that Le, Le Corbusier imposes a grid on Chandigarh because, I mean, Paris is on a grid and it's a beautiful city. Um, mm. it, I think it's, I think it has to do, it's much more the point you, you made about um, it, it was, it was, it, it was a, it was essentially a political project, which is what I was trying to get across right from the beginning, you know. And in India at that time, there were different voices. There was an approach being put forward by Tagore that would be much more um, moderate in terms of not rejecting modernism, but understanding that modernism from Europe could not wouldn't look the same as modernism in India. And um, so there was that debate, internal debate going on that Tagore lost and. Um, Nehru and then the Congress Party, the subsequent Congress Party, kind of um, won out on that. Um, I mean, it, it's not horrible in Chandigarh. You go, I mean, the, the build, it's, it's in many ways, it's very pleasant, you know, and, and if you don't like the crowds and the noise and the muck of, of old Delhi, you know, you'll, you'll probably really love Chandigarh, but um, there is something very kind of um, sort of lacking, lacking from it. You know, there's um, a sort of, a, the unique, the unique personality that an area and the dwellings build up in the way Nile was suggesting. And it wasn't just that it was an administrative center, it was the fact that it was built on a village because Lahore, which is beautiful architecturally, has gone to Pakistan. And then Nehru decides to pick this little village that has no kind of cultural or historical residue from the past. <laughs> And so in that sense, it was a ground zero. I mean, it wasn't imposed by, by Le Cabousier, but it was literally kind of ground zero. And, and, and so and then when you go there and then you compare it to Nek Chan's rock garden, and it's not just a garden, it is a huge space. And the forms in it are, for example, are built by broken electrical plugs from Le Cabousier's buildings. Yeah, all the, literally the detrius from the modernist project goes in a very creative way, I think, to create something that is very imaginative and, and, and rich and complex in a way that the um, modular units, I'm not saying they couldn't work, 
but it's, they don't work in that particular situation. And you know, um, you know, anyone that knows me knows I've, I have no truck with this decolonizing um, idea. But mm. I have to say, I was reading recently from 2015, a review of Chandigarh in the Financial Times. And when you read, read these following lines by a journalist saying, you know, Chandigarh is beautiful, um, unlike other places in India, it has lovely public spaces, you know, other places in India don't have these pretty European square, public squares of public life. And I literally thought, F you, mate. I literally thought, F you, because, you know, if you, anyone goes to India knows public life is just vibrant in every kind of street corner and rickshaw that you, that you go to. So, I mean, he doesn't help people that want to make a universal case, really, things like that. That's... Okay, Penny, do you want to say any final words before I sort of um, then get everybody to applaud you as you deserve and uh, then just sort of open it up to a more informal section of the me of, uh, yeah, as if we were going to the pub, but we're not kind of thing. Um, very briefly, I just wanted to say the problem with modularity in the current period is that the whole process has become more difficult because property is an asset and so I mean the, the, the way that Corb is proposing it I think is the assumption that the state will step in to help with this reorganization the difficulty that we've always had within the market system is that um, you might need the state in order to, to be able to do something universal but in the process of engaging the state in that process, you, you lose something as well. And that's the tension, isn't it, that exists that all architects are constantly trying to negotiate. They're operating in a market system which claims to have ambitions that can be universal. And they're trying to deliver something in universal, but they're constantly coming up against the barriers uh, that are thrown up by the market, which isn't operating universally. So. I, I, I think that's that's the difficulty. And at some points, architects have been very good at recognizing that and other points they've just become sort of patsies in, in the process. It, it depends on the situation. Um, and, and I think Alka's right, you know, the, the, the question obviously that really concerns us is, is public, public life. They're merely providing the framework through which we live out our lives, but I would like them to be as ambitious as they possibly could and what they produce as beautiful as it possibly can be. Um, so that um, so that as part of our broader framework of our lives, we we exist in something that's that's meaningful and has to some extent some kind of sense of possibility embodied in it rather than just being the very basics of what we need. It's a difficult kind of relationship, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I think all of those points that you're making about um, the sense of promise that Le Corbusier offered, you know, the sense of possibility and, that's, and the sense that that promise hasn't really been um, realised and has, is yet to be realised in, in some way, the possibility that you can live in really beautiful homes, however rich or poor you are, um, you know, seems like a great promise, but doesn't, doesn't seem to... Um, have materialized for most people. Um, anyway, Penny, that was really great. I want everybody to unmute themselves and give you a good round of applause as you deserve. Oh, no. <laughs> and um, you can now stay unmuted and hang around if you like. I'll stop sharing, but people can butt in. There's been a lot of stuff in um, 